Welcome to Geared for Growth. I'm your host, Mike Mortlock from MCG Quantity Surveyors, the tax depreciation experts. And today we've got a regional expert. We're talking to buyer's agent Matt Ward from WPG Advisory. Matt's talking to us about a special case study in Orange in New South Wales where he's from. We talk about the Orange market and in more general senses, the regional markets within Australia, what you need to know to understand whether it's a viable market for capital growth. We talk about the local GDP, we talk about unemployment and its implications for growth of an area. We're talking about vacancy rates and I ask him the question about land. It's often a question that people think about when you're investing in a region is that if there are swathes of land or say paddocks that are available to be rezoned to increase the supply, how does that impact the local property market? It's an awesome interview with Matt and I'm sure you'll get a lot out of it. Here's Matt. Matt Ward, thanks for joining me on Geared for Growth. No worries. Thanks, Mike. Matt, I've wanted to, to get you on for a little while um, because a number of reasons, I guess. You've got a valuation background, but you are the man uh, about town in Orange as a buyer's agent. And a lot of media attention has, has been uh, sort of cast on the regional markets in and around the pandemic. I'm wondering if you can sort of tell us what it was like when the pandemic began and people started moving to the regions. Yeah, that, yeah it's a, it was an interesting time and you know, like a lot of people, it was uh, something that was unfolding day by day. Um, initially, the, the world fell off a cliff and um, everyone just sat on their hands and, and wondered what was going to happen. But really, after about six weeks um, of, lock, of that initial lockdown and the government was making noises about uh, light at the end of the tunnel from a, you know, getting back out and, and, and opening up again, that's when everything just started going a bit crazy, I guess. Mm. Um, after people had been locked up in, in particularly in the metro markets, um, in, in smaller accommodation, I suppose, uh, suddenly they realised how small it was when you can't leave the four walls and wanted that space. Mm. Um, and it, it sort of started from there. It started with um, you know, initially investment but also owner-occupation, uh, properties and then particularly the lifestyle stuff. Um, and the biggest thing that you know that I saw was that was the the preparedness of people to move to smaller towns, yep. um, more remote areas, particularly if their budgets didn't allow them to buy in the larger regional centres or they couldn't afford what they wanted. Um, and depending on what sort of jobs they have. Uh, if they're particularly if they're online based or they don't need to be in the office, you know, with the with the restrictions, some people only had access to the office once a month for a couple of days or or, or whatever it was. So, um, you know, I had a couple of clients who were living in Redfern at the time. Um, they they were stuck working at home, so they moved up the up the, up the coast onto a hundred acres. Uh, they had great internet service and. Did all their work remotely. Went back to Sydney for that day a month when they when they needed to, and that was a very common um, theme that ran through a lot of inquiry and, and purchasing at the time. Um, and budgets ranged from a few hundred thousand up to the multi millions. Uh, it was just all about getting out of Sydney, uh, getting out of unit accommodation uh, or small terrace or whatever they were living in, um, and and getting onto some space. And as long as you know, the, the key thing was you know. Um, not necessarily close to town, but certainly good internet service um, and ability to perhaps drive back to Sydney yep. on a day trip or an extended day trip. And they were sort of the two, two key criteria that most of them had. Um, and then after that, it got a bit more personal for various things. But uh, I think what hasn't been spoken about with all this COVID and working from home is, is the success of the NBN program. Mm -hmm. um, and how that has changed people's ability to live and and still maintain potentially a metro-based job and salary, but being able to transfer into the regions and maintain that um, and allow a different sort of lifestyle um, uh, to be lived, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It was interesting. 
and, and I guess as we talk more and more about housing affordability crisis, there's a lot of people in the regions, I suppose, like yourself, will put your hand up and sort of say, well, like out here, we don't have an affordability crisis, right? I wonder if, um, if, if that infrastructure that we've got access to, like the NBN, will see Australia becoming a little bit more like US, having, you know, big many big cities across the country, both on the coast and, and, and inland, but we are very predominantly an eastern seaboard or, or at least a, a coastal sort of uh, operation. Um, with with the pandemic, there was a lot of press about people just flooding to the regions and there was some commentators that were sort of suggesting that this is this is a bit of a sugar pill. You know, the sea change, tree change might be great for a while, but people will, you know, lament the fact that they can't go to their local Ethiopian restaurant or the big shows that come into town. Ha- have you sort of seen people sort of sweep in and sweep out like those commentators were suggesting? No, I haven't actually. Um Look, case by case, people people's will have their own experience. But as a, a market trend, uh, certainly not. People who have moved, they moved for a reason, they knew why they were moving, uh, and they're embracing what they've moved to. Um, yeah. And and they're finding different things to do, which perhaps they didn't have it, have um, the opportunity or exposure to uh, with a, uh, moving to a regional area. Mm. Um and I, I guess, you know, okay, Australia's in love with the beach, but there's plenty of people who live in Sydney who are still an hour from the beach and never go there. They could be 15 <laughs> minutes from the beach and never go there. So how important is the beach in your daily lifestyle? Um, you know, I get to the beach a couple of times a year and that's enough for me. Mm. Um, I think if I live, live closer, I still wouldn't be going any more regularly. Um, whereas other people, it's a daily ritual. So it depends on what you're currently doing anyway. Uh, and then... And then, you know, what's the region's got to offer for you? So um, the, the flooding back to the, to the city, no. There's certainly some people who probably and gone, geez, this is not what I expected or they've moved to the wrong location or jobs have now saying, now, well, now you've got to be back in the city and they've moved too far to commute, so now they've got to either find jo- new jobs or, or move back. But it's certainly not a market trend at this stage. Mm. Uh, I'm wondering what made uh, regions such as Orange so popular. I mean, Orange is a fairly, you know, it's not a long way from um, from Sydney, right? You know, I had a friend who went to stay in Kununurra and his, you know, his joke was that they just got the Titanic in the local theatre, you know. Like, Orange is not that remote a location, but of course it's not a commute to the city for a job. You know, it's got a, a wine region, it's got a, a diverse uh, economy, Orange was definitely one of the beneficiaries um, of, say, capital growth with people looking to markets like Orange. What, what, what can you put your finger on as, as being one of the main uh, motivators for people or the drivers of, of local property? Yeah, look, it's certainly an affordability factor. Um, we are still a day trip to Sydney if you need it to be or there's regular flights even into Brisbane and Melbourne. These days, um, that's been a massive uh, game changer for this city, um, and it's certainly affordability. I mean, if you're trying to spend or buy a unit somewhere around the harbour, you know, uh, you need the best part of one and a half to two million dollars, and that's for a you know, basic sort of old style unit. Or you can come out here and buy a, a pretty modern five bedroom home on five acres for one and a half million dollars. Mm. Um, you know, that's a massive, massive difference. Um, prices have certainly, uh, you know, you could argue to say doubled uh, in the last three years. So uh, that's partly cyclical. It was, it was coming anyway. Um, I think the speed at which it happened in a period of time during COVID that it also happened probably shocked a lot of people. Um, when the expectation was the markets were going to crash, they actually exploded. Um, so there's that side of things. Um, and whilst properties have have doubled, they're still, from a metro point of view, still relatively affordable. You know, you, you, if you come into this town with even you know, a million dollars, which is the starting point in Sydney for a lot of property, um, you're still buying very good quality property, proper homes on, on good blocks in good parts of town. Um, uh, so that's still affordable. 
I guess the only thing now is that it's got to the point price-wise and, and rental return-wise is can the local salaries support the new price levels? Mm. levels? Um, and that's still playing out, I think, and that's something that I'm certainly conscious of. Um, you know, the median income of Orange is certainly lower than probably the median income of, of Sydney, um, in certain parts of Sydney anyway, um, if, if you're using that as a comparison. So, but on the, on the flip side of it, there's a lot of people now have a lot more equity in their homes than they did three, year, four years ago, yes. which allows them to, to step up if, if that's what they're doing. Um, but I, from a, you know, Orange is, I guess, a little bit different to most regional towns is that its main employment is skilled workers. So you've got, you know, a large gold mine. It's not the major employment in the town, but it certainly drives a lot of um, well-paid people, as does the uni- university education process um, and the medical, massive medical in- industry here, as long as, as long as government and professional services. So they're all industries where... Salaries are generally good. Um, some other regional towns don't have that mix. You know, they certainly have, still have diverse economies, but they're more unskilled labour or, or manufacturing or mm. whatever the deal is. Um, so the ability of the rental market to be able to afford the new levels of rent um, will be interesting. Um, and so, yeah, that obviously impacts on return on investment versus the purchase price. Um, I'm not expecting values to come back. They will bubble along, probably as per a normal market cycle. Um, in a few years' time, when things have settled and everyone's regrouped, um, yeah, in theory, you'll see another kick. Um, but that would be a few years away yet, I would think. Mm. It's interesting you, you talk about there being a potential sort of ceiling or at least a, a headwind with affordability. You know, we heard a lot of that stuff around Sydney. First it was, you know, the median price will never get over a million dollars because that's just a psychological barrier that people can't deal with and it charged on through. You know, the um, the asset price to average wage, you know, can't be more than 20 times because, you know, how is that being supported? And it kind of pushed through that because we've got, you know, intergenerational wealth and we've got you know increases in wages although modest I'm wondering are, are there things that you sort of look at um, as an investor yourself sort of looking into the other regions do you think that 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 price differential is always going to be something that people need to consider because I can remember before Brisbane having its um, crazy run it was talked about for 10 years as just it had to boom because it was half the price of sydney and half the price of melbourne do you do you sort of buy into that the give for growth property investing podcast is presented by our business mcg quantity surveyors if you're an investor or a property professional looking to get the best tax depreciation deductions for yourself or your clients please get in touch with us at mcgqs.com.au. It's our mission to help as many property investors as we can to maximise their claims and maximise their property education as well. Uh, yeah, it's a mindset thing too. You know, people get certainly uh, get stuck with a, um, how do you say, a, a price expectation of what a, a house is worth, you know, this 10 Smith Street, it's a four-bedroom brick veneer, 400000 Oh, that's crazy money. That's, you know, now it's 800000 Oh, geez. In five years' time, people will have adjusted to the new price norm and um, it, and then say, okay, well, the house is 800000 I can't believe you'd ever pay 400000 for it. And, you know, if you look back through time, um, the, the, the values of property, particularly for the last 30 years at, at least, has, has generally gone up. To, you know, Orange, as a case study, certainly has. Yep. Um, and if you look back at what prices were back in 1990, people forget that you could buy a house for $100,000. Uh, that same house now might be worth a million, million, million and two. Um, so somewhere over the last 30 years, there's been a a mindset adjustment to, okay, now that house is worth more money and I don't think wages have significantly grown in the last 30 years in comparison to property values. Yeah. So um, 
what has changed is the, is the funding the funding rules. Uh, you no longer need a 20% deposit. The interest rates have been falling for the best part of 20, 25 years, uh, making money cheaper. Um, and you can, you know, for a period of time there, you didn't need any money to buy a house as long as you could get a loan and, you know, um, you could have 100% funding. Yeah. Service it, yeah. So they're the things I believe have helped property values grow. Um, you know, if all of a sudden we went back to, yeah, well, we're almost there, I guess, 8 or 9% interest rates and 20% deposits, um, that would really pull the horns back in on the property growth, property value growth. Um, so we've sort of backed ourselves into a corner from the property industry as to, okay, well, how, how do we sustain it now? Um, uh, you know, we could go down the path of countries like Japan, which I think had intergenerational mortgages because the property prices were so high for a period of time. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't like to see that play out in Australia, um, but if it you know, keeps going, I mean, you can't control what people are willing to pay for something. Um, but, you, you know, the government and the, and the policy makers can influence it through interest rates and other regulations. Mm. Um, so, yeah, uh, the, other, the only other way out of it is to be, you know, wage, wage increase in inflation. Um, the inflation certainly kicking in at the moment. Hopefully wages will, will follow suit to, to help compensate that. Yeah, for sure. When, when you're looking at regions from an investor point of view, you talked about the diversification of Orange, you know, not only have you got things like the gold mine, which can be uh, big employers, but professional services and, and medical. I mean, it is... It is an economy unto itself in, in Orange. What do you think are, are some of the bare minimum things you like to see? You know, we talk, there's a lot of different regional markets, you know, like Bendigo and Ballarat and Albury and, you know, Sunshine Coast, places like that that have done well during the pandemic as well for different reasons. But if people are, are wanting to go to the regions as an investor because they're getting more bang for buck, what do you think is a good size region to be getting into? Or what, what do you think are some of the employers that you want to see active there that sort of de risk it yeah that's a that's a good question you know i i tend to go for um you know size population size for starters and then we look at what the breakdown of that economy is and where's people people uh, how are people getting employed um i really stick steer away from one industry towns um you know, particularly mining towns or towns that only survive off it Agriculture, for instance, um, you know, you will still make money in those towns um, if you hang in there long enough and, and, and ride the seasons and, or, or the economic cycles. Um, but it certainly comes with an element of risk. And so to, to de-risk that, you need a, a town of a certain population size. Uh, I like to sort of stick above generally 20,000 people. Um, and that is usually a large enough town to, to diversify the economy and have some some other employment sectors rather than a single dominant sector. Yep. Um, uh, and then, yeah, and then you look at other what what else is happening in and around that town. What and what industries are are in that town? Um, how much government support is is there? Um, um, These are probably the main factors. Uh, anything smaller than that are not market. Are not market drivers, they're market followers. So if you take a look at the markets that are happening you know, in the villages that are around Orange, for instance, uh, or the smaller towns that are around Orange, Orange was the first one to kick. And then all of a sudden, a uh, village that's 30 minutes away looks incredibly cheap. So it's starting yeah. to get dragged along in the Orange um, price rise. It's not in isolation driving itself. Um, so... Yeah, it's those sorts of things that um, you know look at, and, and, when, and what's happening with the infrastructure? Does it have planes? Does it you know? Does it have a, a like an airport, a rail services, bus services? Um, what are the roads like heading into it? Um, any other sort of key infrastructure pieces that are coming that might help those towns in the near future? Yeah, some awesome advice there. Interesting to hear you talk about you know 
riding the seasons as well as the cycles because I guess if you have an exposure to agriculture which people wouldn't be quite used to if they're living in red fern like your clients you mentioned you know whether it's raining or whether it's you know not raining can have a, a difference uh, on, on the local uh, economy um, but is that something that you see in orange or is it just those smaller say sub 20,000 population areas yeah look it's orange is pretty pretty robust I mean it does have a an ag uh, element to it through the horticultural but just general um, ag as well but it's not a major employer. Um, there's a lot of off-farm income. So, you know, whilst they might be running a farm, um, someone, either the, the direct farmer themselves or their spouse might be working in town. So there's, you know, the farming income is supplemented. Mm. Um, you know, there's plenty of people like myself, I guess. You know, I have a, a small agri business raising some cattle. It's certainly not my nine to five. Um, so whether the cattle markets up or down it's not impacting on my on my day job yeah. so much um uh, so therefore my spending habits don't alter too much whether it's raining or, or not and i think that's you know this I'm, I'm very similar to a lot of people in the regions the regional cities um you have a you have a day job but also play on the farms on the weekends so they're not the, the towns aren't impacted as much i suppose mm. um, uh, with the diversification that, say, Orange has um, around the Medico and the pro- professional services, uh, as we were sort of saying earlier, you know, death and taxes, people are always yeah. uh, going to need some sort of professional services and health service, whether it's raining or not. Um, uh, mining goes on. I mean, the mine at the moment has had a bit of an issue. It's closed down for a couple of weeks with a water leak, effectively, Um but production still happened because of the way they managed it. So people are still going to work and still earning the income. Yep. Um, yeah, and they, with the so the town doesn't notice notice it actually. Yeah, it just keeps keeps charging on. I guess the key word is in that diversification. So Matt, to to finish us off, if if people are looking at investing in the in the regions from a property investor point of view, what are your top tips on on things that they should be wary of, or or things that maybe are ticking those boxes to say, look, this is a region that is is worthy of investment. Yeah, it's certainly it's um, it, it's the, the GDP, and you can look these sort of figures up. Um, you know, see which way the GDP is going. Uh, where's it? Which way is our employment heading, um, and what are the vacancy rates? Um, you know, a lot of regional towns at the moment are certainly tight on vacancy. Um, you need to understand why that is happening. Um, there's, you know, most of it at the moment is a, a housing shortage, uh, so that'll be a, an ongoing issue. Um, unemployment. If you know, there's basically at the moment there's a staff shortage everywhere um we're dealing in a little bit of unusual times but um i think the biggest thing to is that em- employment levels have, have been down and, and tr- still trending down in any of those locations um you know, like all things they'll be cyclical but as long as they're over the long term um, not on the on the rise you yeah, should, should be right um and uh, yeah, how how hard is the, the local economy trading? Uh, yeah. What's the GDP doing over the last period of time? It's, it's trending up as well. Well, the economy is strong. Um, strong economy creates employment. Employment creates demand for housing. Yeah, away some, you go. Some awesome tips there. Um, the GDP one, especially, um, hadn't sort of really thought about that from a regional point of view. We tend to talk more about national, but that data is available. I want to ask you just one last question before we go, and that's the question of of supply. I mean, if you if you picture, let's say Brisbane, um, Sydney, maybe is a better example. You can only go so far east before you hit the water, unless we're doing one of those um, Dubai style sand island things. You know, we're going to run out of space. Then. You You've got the sort of the mountains yep. to the left. The, you know, the the ability to create new housing stock is is very very constricted 
uh, in places like Sydney. Whereas if you think about Orange, now it's probably a little bit harder to, to picture for listeners on a map, but I'm assuming that there are swathes of, of green land if you're looking at it from a satellite view. So there is that opportunity for housing developments to, to pop up and, and people sort of view that as a risk for the, the regions. Is that something that, that you sort of think about yourself or, or something that investors should really be considering, that there is that availability of land and that can change the demand? And supply fundamentals? Not really, no. Um, I'm currently working on a couple of rezoning pro- programs at the moment, and it's incredibly difficult to release those greenfield sites. There's, you know, there's multi levels of planning, law, and, and process uh, that, that you know, constrict the ability to to release lands. Just because you've got a paddock next to a housing estate doesn't mean you can put houses on it. There's a multi-year, multi-government layer process that you've got to go through to to have that land available. Uh, then you've got to service it and construct it. So the ability for, the, and this is what we've seen during COVID, um, you know, the ability f- to quickly turn on the tap for new land opportunities is it just doesn't exist in the current New South Wales planning policies. Um, yes, we're surrounded by thousands of millions of acres, but you can't access it. Um, and the process is... A three to five year program um, to 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 even achieve it. So that's something that you know state government has recognised and that they need to um, streamline that process. Uh, but it's still still years still still a years long process. Um, and a lot of the regional cities have been caught short um, with with lack of appropriately zoned land uh, just to keep up with the normal demand, let alone creating an oversupply. So for the next three to five years anyway, there's going to be this housing issue, affordability issue, lack of new stock coming onto the market um, uh, until a significant volume of land is, is released, or rezoned, developed and released and built on. Um, it's not going to be a six-month cure to, mm. to that. It's, it's five years, more maybe. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I have heard that comment before, but the reality is it, it just doesn't happen like that. Um, I think you're probably, it's probably easier to get things like that happening in Sydney, mm-hmm. um, to be honest. Yes, you are constrained but uh, by some geographical issues down there, but the, the planning mindset is different um, and they are quite happy to open up hundreds of acres at any particular time. Mm-hmm meet the demand down there yeah that's interesting i suppose by the time those projects come to fruition that you know the town's probably grown and the demand is is always outstripping that supply whether those projects come on or not um matt uh thank you for sharing all of your advice and wisdom today i really appreciate that deep dive into into the regions and and orange as well no worries thanks for having mike it's been good to chat cheers